Well, I'm Rob Fisher. I'm the CEO of UKMHA, and we partner with SMB College to deliver our apprenticeship program. I'd like to share something inspiring with all of you. Some of you may have attended or read about this year's Archies, where we celebrated outstanding achievements in our industry. You might recall that Mike Barton, the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award, proudly shared that he began his career as an apprentice engineer. Similarly, my predecessor, Tim Waples, also was an engineering apprentice. Tim went on to have a long and prosperous career, eventually leading Doosan Industrial Vehicles here in the UK. These examples highlight something crucial. With the right start and mindset, a strong work ethic and dedication, there's no limit to what can be achieved. Programmes like our own are essential for closing the skills gap and ensuring that our industry continues to thrive. We are at a pivotal moment, especially with the rise of automation and AI. Now more than ever, we need a workforce that's adaptable, innovative and ready to embrace change. Apprenticeships are not only a proven pathway to success, but they are also a sustainable solution for businesses that need to build a highly skilled homegrown workforce. Our apprenticeship scheme offers young people the opportunity to, to develop cutting edge skills and start meaningful long careers in our industry. The programme has been designed in collaboration with SMB College to meet the specific needs of our industry. After all, engineers and technicians are the backbone of the material handling sector. And by vesting in the apprenticeship engineers, we are safeguarding the future. Apprenticeships offer a win-win solution. They allow businesses to develop talent from within while giving young people the opportunity to earn while they learn gaining valuable hands-on experience and building a meaningful career. It's a valuable resource, packed with useful tips and insights. It covers everything from recruitment strategies to the financial support available, including how to access the apprenticeship levy. It explains the free recruitment services that SMB provide, along with shortlisting applicants, assessments and interviews, and starting your own talent pool. So firstly, obviously we understand the benefits of um, taking on apprentices and predominantly that's about managing your recruitment, um, your potential recruitment pipeline, giving you an opportunity to truly shape young people for tomorrow. So it's about, it's about giving you the opportunity to work with them early on. So there is a process that we go through um, with regards to um, recruiting an apprentice and it can be quite complex. Um, so it's about trying to make that as easy as possible for employers. So I know Sam, obviously we've got, got the crown, crown group, so it's, um, it's trying to make sure that we handhold you through that process. Um, so obviously the first, first part of that process is making sure we've got the employer interest. Um, we need to make sure that you can achieve that range of the apprenticeship standard. So it's making sure that we have the conversation so we don't set that young person up to fail, that we make sure that they can get the right experience and ultimately successfully achieve their EPA at the end of their three years. So it may be there's two types of positions for the apprenticeships. It might be that you've already identified somebody or it might be that you need to recruit. If you do need to recruit somebody new, then we would work with you and we have a talent pool and I'll talk you through that a little bit a little bit um, on the next slide. Um, so it's about making sure that we help you select that right person. So you might have already done your recruitment process and that's fine, or we can help you with that stage. Um, there's some documentation that we would need to go through. So that's um, it's called a apprenticeship training service agreement. We need to go through health and safety and make sure you've got an ELI in place and also help you through um, setting up on the digital apprenticeship service. So we would handhold you and support you through all that process. We, so we've recently used, uh, we're using a system called eSignUp. Um, so it's capturing from the very beginning, the first part of that enrolment process is getting the candidates to complete um, an enrolment form. So they provide us lots of, um, lots of information to enable us to start that process off. Um, once we've got all the information from the employer and we've got the information from um, the candidate or the potential apprentice, 
then the curriculum will speak to them about a skill scan and they will take them through a process to understand where they are with the learning so we can shape that training plan to meet their requirements. Part of that enrolment process, what's really key is that we tailor it to that individual. So we make sure that we understand and we recognise what they've learnt previously. We, we look at maths and English, and maths and English is really key. As part of the apprenticeship, if they haven't got the appropriate grades that they need, we will do additional blocks. So separate to their core learning, they will have additional blocks for maths and English. Um, and that will be worked on um, depending on what actually they need to support them through to the EPA, but they do need to requ um, are required to get the maths and English if they haven't already got it when they're employed. Um, and also, some of our learners or um, you know the apprentices they do have additional learning support. So it's making sure that we we identify that early on and make sure that we shape that individual plan to incorporate that support that they might that wraparound support they might need around that. Um, we spend a lot of our a lot of our time working with national employers, um, so working with um, on block, coming here on block weeks. So it's having accommodation and transport um, involved around that. Like I said, there is an e sign up process, so should you um, want to go through the apprenticeship, we will talk you through that process, and everything's done and signed for electronically. Um, so we're completely moving f away from the paper-based paper system, which does make that process a little bit easier. So one of the things, as just a quote there, so we actually have worked very closely with Toyota this, this year regarding their recruitment process. What that involved is at the very beginning we did some webinars, we did some joint social media campaigns, um, we helped with that first sift. Um, we then managed the recruitment process in that we um, called, um, the, called the apprentices or the candidates um, and we did an interview process with them, shortlisted it down and then worked with Toyota regarding their assessment days. And I think one of the things that we helped with um, was rather than just sending out, so we send out the invites, but it's also keeping those candidates warm so that that had a good high turnout so um the other thing that we did with toyota so we had we had lots of applications but they only had a certain amount of roles to fill so we worked with the candidate and we kept their information um and we 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 create a talent pool from that so what you don't want to do is if you've got people showing an interest in the industry is to lose them um so we're trying to build up and we will continue to build up that talent pool to if anyone's applied, shared an interest, how do we keep them and actually attract them into the industry? So there is two ways. If you are a organization which has a wage bill over three million, then you would be known as a levy payer. If you are a non-levy payer, so you have 50, um, you don't have a wage bill over three million, then um, you would, the government would pay 90% of the funding and you would pay 5%. So any um, candidates or any apprentices that you take on aged between 16 and 18, the government pay 100% of the funding. Um, and also if they are um, got an EHCP, then it's between 19 and 24 if they come from um, care or have an, an education health plan. With regards to um, 16 to 18 years olds, there's also a thousand pound support, which gets paid um, at three and three months and at um, one year of when they've done their apprenticeship, and that gets paid to the organisation. So what do you need to do as employers? And I think this is really key to understand what that whole process is. Obviously, I've talked about the recruitment process and selecting the right candidate, then going through and making sure that we've got the right training plan in place, that we understand that you can meet the range. Um, and we would help you make sure you can register on the apprenticeship service so we can talk you through that process. Um, one of the key things is making sure that as you're recruiting an apprentice, you have an identified a mentor within your organisation because the mentor is a key part for that young person's journey um, and so it's really important that's identified very early on as well. Obviously you need to make sure that you pay them, um, that doesn't come out of your apprenticeship levy um, and it's making sure 
um, that is national, there is a apprenticeship pay scale, I think it's £6.40 at the moment, um, that they would need to get paid. You obviously need to treat them as an employee as well, I think that's really key, um, and making sure that you, you treat them as an employee but you understand that they aren't as skilled, uh, so you can't just leave them on their own to get on with tasks unless you are sure they are able to complete that task. So that health and safety part, part is really key as well. Um, and provide, yeah, providing that safe learning environment. So um, my, na my name is uh, Paul. Um, my job title's changed. So my, my job title now is um, Director of Engineering, Automotive and New Technologies. And new technologies I'll talk to you about very, very briefly um, in a while. I've been at the college for about three and a half years. And in that three and a half years, there's been quite a lot of change for us within my area. And one of the biggest changes is the um, introduction to Fortlift Truck. Fortlift Truck I've worked with, I've worked with the sector with apprentices back in my previous college. So really excited to have the opportunity um, when it was presented to me um, to start working with the sector again. We started work with Crown. Um, and that, that, that first year, that programme was very, very steady. But last year, this is where it's just gone for us. And it's really, really exciting. Um, and I'd really like to um, get you guys to join us if, if this is the right thing for you. With regards to what I'm going to be talking about, I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction to the SMB group. Um, I've got a few names up here. I was hoping some of the team would be able to join me, but they're all teaching, so we'll go and do an observation on them um, in, a, in a while when we do a bit of a, a tour. I can talk you around um, the organisation uh, with regards to how we plan um, the programme, um, and then obviously leading up to, to the EPA, the endpoint assessment side of things. So that's hopefully what I'm going to try and be capturing um, with you today. So. Colville Technical College, or Stevenson College, has been about, for around about, well, it's celebrating 100 years this year. I actually went to Colville Technical College as a 14-year-old. One of them pains in the backsides at school that weren't able to concentrate. So I absolutely, you know, adore this college. Um, so, yeah, it's been going for around about um, 100 years. In January 2020, so that was just before lockdown, um, they went into merger with Brooksby. And Melton and that brought us um, a lot of strength um, so a wider array of assets a wider array of our staff um, and financial support as well so that worked really really well for us however we are looking at joining um, Loughborough College in a merger probably looking into that next year and again what that does for us in this area is g gives us more strength um, which so we're looking forward um, to that uh, going forward but it's just at the moment it's just in the discussion stages so we're going through all that due diligence etc etc just to give you an idea of the size of the area that I'm working in just on apprentices alone I've got in excess of 350 so that is increasing um, all the time which is fantastic one of the good things about Stevenson College it has got a history of national apprenticeship programs so a lot of the stuff that we do is quite natural to us. It's really exciting starting something new because it's whatever we want. But with, with regards to the expertise the college has, it's got a really, really good pedigree. Um, so like I say, things come naturally um, to us. So a little bit about um, the, the program as a whole. So with regards to the standard, I'm going to use the abbreviation IFATE. So that's the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. And there's a link on there, and I'll make sure I share the link with everybody. Um, so that is where all the details for the apprenticeship programme is. So if you are interested, that is where we get all our information from. So that, what that will show you is what the standard is about, the sort of job role that the person needs to have to do that standard. It gives you funding information. It gives you the um, skills, knowledge and behaviours um, that we need to educate the students, the apprentices towards. And it also gives you the endpoint assessment plan. So it gives you an idea of what sort of things we, we do throughout the programme. There is a block planner in place and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. So the block planner, so all the dates are set. So if we are looking into next year, for example, uh, so 
September sort of time for recruiting your apprentices, you will get the dates in and around April and May, and they will be set in stone. Um, so they, there should be no reason that we, we need to change them. Obviously, we need to make sure that the apprentices don't take holidays in that time. If they've got this chance of a lifetime to go somewhere, then what we'll do is try and fill them in another block. So it's not the end of the world, but it's just a lot easier if we don't need to, to do that. The, the way that I've got the program planned, and I say planned at this time, is it's planned because I've not been all the way through it yet because it's a brand new program. So we've planned for 36 months. The way that the program is designed is that the training is over 24 weeks. So that's definitely two full years and then just tipping into a year three. Um, as it stands now, if it works, happy days. If not, with the guys that are going through now, I'll add a little bit of time on. So it's, it's in and around 36 months. That's what we're planning for. Um, the criteria, and hopefully there should be one in your packs, it gives you an idea of what the skills, knowledge and behaviours are. And the reason why we've done that is to give employers and the apprentices as much support as possible. I've spoken, and this was um, influenced by HGV, to be honest. So when I started here and I went into the companies and started asking them, how, how is things going? Are you getting all the information that you need? One of the big pockets that they have is, we don't know what to do. Which, which I was horrified on. So back in the day when we used to have frameworks, there used to be a qualification. So there were a qualification here that they did in college and a qualification that we used to do in the workplace. And the assessor used to come out and they used to steer the apprentices and yourselves through that qualification. Well, there's no qualifications anymore. So the skills, knowledge and behaviours document is there to give you guys a little bit of guidance on what sort of you, things you can do in the workplace. The way that the apprenticeship works, it's a three-way process. So it's the apprentice, it's yourselves, and it's ourselves. And we've all got to work together to make sure that it's beneficial for the apprentice. So if anything's going wrong with, with our side of things, I need to know about it so I can put it right. And then obviously I'll do the same with yourselves and, and the apprentices as well. The assessors will um, visit every 10 to 12 weeks. So what their remit is, is to come out to support the mentor, really. Um, to make sure that the mentor's happy with regards to what we want the mentor to support the apprentice with, but also that the um, apprentice is okay. Um, and then we can bring you additional information from college as well. Um, again, what should be in your document is a skills, knowledge um, and behaviors document. Now all this details is, it says on their duties. So there's 12 duties and that's the sort of job that we are expecting the apprentices over them three years to be good at. All right, so again, it gives the mentor a bit of an idea of what they can direct them towards. And what we've also got in that document is the skills, knowledge, and behaviors that break down and they work inside the duties. So you can actually see that we're going to be working with, I don't know, telematics, for example, or we're going to be working on elements of health and safety. So the criteria is absolutely broke right down. So again, key information that we can start delivering in the workplace to accompany what we deliver here. When their endpoint assessment time arrives, the training is finished. And then they'll go into what we call the EPA phase. Now the EPA phase is that they have built a portfolio, which we will do all the way through the program. Um, it'll be referenced to what the endpoint assessment organization needs. So we'll take care of all of that side of things. The apprentice will have to sit an online test so all online tests, we will be practicing all the way through the program. They have to hold a professional discussion with somebody from the sector. So we'll make sure that they've got that confidence all the way through the program and the knowledge and the experience. So when they are talking through their own personal portfolios with this person from the sector, they will be absolutely confident to do that. Okay, so any exposure, I was talking to one of, the, one of you guys today, any exposure you can give to customers with regards to that early conversation, that's the sort of thing that starts building their confidence. Don't put them in front of them nasty customers. All right, so put them in front of the nice ones. Um, and then the, the last part of the endpoint assessment, which will be done here, so we've got that comfortable environment for them to work in that they are familiar with, are four practical tasks. And the practical tasks will include things like um, an inspection, um, there may be a maintenance procedure, there may be a fault diagnosis procedure, uh, a, re a remove and install procedure, and something to do with hydraulics. So 
So that's roughly what sort of things they do. But again, all the way through, with your help and support, we'll make sure that the apprentices are ready and go through, through that process. And we want distinctions. You know, you can pass the program with a pass and you can pass it with a distinction. So the distinctions is what we're aiming towards. On that right hand side, you will see what sort of work and assessments are going to take place whilst they're here, because we need to make sure that the apprentices are staying on track of everything. So there'll be whatever we've delivered, there'll be an end of test block. That information with regards to their achievement on that assessment will be fed back to you in a block report at the end of every block. So you'll know what they've done, what's coming next, how well they've done with regards to attitude, behavior, test results, all that information will be available to you to look at. And there also homework as well. We do not want the apprentices just to come here to get education, go in the workplace for six weeks, come back here for education. They need to be educated all the way through because that will help with their learning because of the, it's, it's constant. Towards the end of this document that you see on the left hand side is what sort of workplace evidence we want. So we've broke it down to try and make it as easy as possible. So the first year we want things like servicing on different trucks, we want inspections on different trucks. So that's the sort of information we want the apprentices to do in year one. In year two it's working with all different systems, so you're probably looking at a remove and install task. And then in year three, or towards that advanced diagnostics that we start delivering, it is about then complex faults. So we want them to experience diagnosing a complex fault, repairing the complex fault, and checking everything is right at the end of that. Again, to try and make things as easy as possible, that portfolio has got to be made up of a technical write-up. So we've got um, a document that we use, and what it does, it pinpoints everything we need the apprentice to mention. So, so long as they fill every box, everything that we're requiring it of them is going to be captured in some way. So once they've done that technical write-up sheet and it comes back to us, we'll check it. So long as it's got enough in there, we'll be happy with that. But what we need to make sure every single time is that there's improvements made. Year one, I'm not too worried about them, but it's the year three stuff. That's where we want that absolutely fantastic portfolio evidence, something that they can be proud of and that they can keep. This is a bit of an idea of what the block planner will, sorry, what the block report will look like. So again, um, college progress, knowledge covered. So we'll break that down with regards to what's been covered and the skills, what we've covered as well. So what we've done in the workshop. We'll talk about the behaviors. So the behaviors is a part of the standard and it's not about little Johnny or Sally um, behaving when they come to college. It's about how they interact. It's about what you expect the behaviors to be for a person within your workplace so that they do work as part of a team. When they are given a part and a role to play in that team role, they understand what it is they've got to do. They understand who it is and how it is they communicate within your workplace. There's a thing called off the job. That's 20%, about six, six hours a week. Now the off the job is the amount of training they have to do alongside the standard. And the training isn't just what's at college, even though we do help and support with that. So when they come each week here, that's 24 hours each week towards their off the job total. That off the job has to be recorded every month. That's a responsibility of the apprentice. But there will be a small amount that you guys have to do in the workplace with them. And it is a very small amount. So it's things like when you do the inductions right at the very beginning, that is all off the job training sending them on a fire marshalling course, a driver awareness course uh, with regards to lift trucks. That is essential for their jobs. That is off the job hours. Okay, so that just gives you a bit of an idea of what sort of things that is. So th this is something I normally de deliver with the apprentices, um, to be honest. And what I want them to do is be accountable. Back in the day, and certainly early on when I started working here with the HGV, there was a lot of responsibility and accountability that the apprentices didn't take on. They expected everything to be done for them. This is the apprentice's apprenticeship. It's not yours, it's not mine, it's the apprentice's apprenticeship. So we need to make sure that we get across, with your support, their responsibility. So they have got to um, hit deadlines. They have got to do homework that's set. We do expect high expectations. All right. So that's the sort of thing that we try and push from a college perspective. 
On that right hand side, we've, we've gone through a lot of them. That's basically the makeup of the apprenticeship standard. This, this is set in stone, unless you are quite passionate about wanting me to change things. 16 to 18 year olds, if they come to us, they would stay in sheltered accommodation. They will stay with landladies. I talked to you about, um, we've done national apprenticeships for a long time. Th these landladies have been doing this for years and years and years. They look after the apprentices like they're their own. Okay, they're all safeguard checked, um, so they're all safe. We will um, pick them up in the morning um, with a minibus, we'll bring them to college, we'll take them back um, to their accommodation as well. So every, all that transportation is sorted. Um, and obviously evening meals and breakfast is, is sorted as well. Anybody 18 and over, we'll look to put them in a hotel. And again, they don't need to drive. We will go, we'll pick them up from the hotel, we will bring them back here um, to do their learning and then obviously take them back a, bit, a little bit later on. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is um, Smart Assessor. All the apprentices information will be uploaded to it so it'll be nice and safe. Once the assessors have marked it and assessed it and given feedback on it, we will be able to monitor using Smart Assessor their progress. And you will also be able to monitor their progress as well. Okay, so everything is there, everything's transparent, everything is there for everybody to see.